Prairie Yard and Garden is a production of the University of Minnesota Morris in cooperation with Pioneer Public Television. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided in part by Heartland Motor Company, providing service for over 30 years in the heart of truck country. Heartland Motor Company, we have your best interest at heart. Farmers Mutual Telephone Company and Federated Telephone Cooperative, proud to be powering ASIRA. Mark and Margaret Yako Jolene, in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHill.org. The first four years of my education were spent at a one room country schoolhouse. We had so much fun chasing butterflies and exploring the plants on the prairie during recess. One day, we found a patch of wild onions, which we all just had to try. When the school bell called us in, we smelled so bad, the teacher sent us back outside for the rest of the day. Today, we are going to see if another teacher has had stinkers like us on her prairie. My love of the outdoors started early in life. There was always so much to see and explore on the prairie that stretched for miles around our farm and my school. Today Prairie Yard and Garden is going to visit with Laura Molinar, a teacher who is trying to educate as well as encourage a love of the great outdoors. Welcome Laura. So glad that we, you get to spend some time in our prairie today Mary. Laura, tell us, what do you teach and how long have you been teaching? I teach fifth grade science now, so five times a day I have different groups of students and I teach science all day. I've been teaching for, this will be my 36th year in the classroom. Wow, how did you get the idea to, to do this, uh, to get it started? Well, many years ago at our elementary site, we um, had applied for a grant through the SNAP program, the School Nature Area Project, which is funded through a Blandon grant. And um, I learned so much through that um, School Nature Area Project from the educators that helped walk us through how to develop a prairie. And then I was moved to the middle school and lost because I didn't have a place where I could take my students outside. So we started doing a little research and found out that this land belonged to the school. And right now we're standing right outside past the school parking lot. So we are very close to my classroom here. It was a field of brome grass and thistle and some really good stubborn patches of poison ivy. <laughs> it was covered with debris from construction and it really um, had no diversity and and but uh, we were able to see that there was promise here with just a little bit of patience well because we were part of a school nature area project we learned so much about the importance of engaging a wide um, group of of supporters we set up an advisory board and the advisory board included people from our soil water conservation district from the DNR, trails and wildlife, people from the Waterfowl Association, Isaac Walton League, some teachers, a school board member, and a member of the custodial staff and an administrator. And so we learned that by having um, this team of people who not only could be um, excited or give us also resources, but also the people that could help make, make it happen. And so we brought that advisory board together um, and, and showed them our site and said we would like to have permission to pursue this land for an outdoor classroom. 
And so we started first writing a grant to the University of Minnesota. They have a grant program called a NEST grant. We received that multiple times and also a large grant from the Ag Teachers Association. And our last large grant came from the Pheasants Forever have a par pollinator partnership grant. And so we received that as well. Who did all of the clearing and how did you get rid of all the brome grass and where did you start? We have a wonderful ag department at New London Spicer Schools and, and the teachers, the ag teachers, Tracy Tevin and, and Jeff Gabrielson have partnered with us on this. So all the labor for clearing the land um, has been done by those ag students and our fifth graders. So we first had to remove all the construction debris and then we did a burn. We just burned what was here just to kind of give us a clean canvas. So we looked at this as being a five-year project. We set a kind of a timeline and we experimented with a number of different ways to prepare the soil. So the, our first area that we did, we, as I said, we burned it and then we sprayed it and we let it set for a year. And then the next spring, we came in and seed planted it and planted forbs and plugs of grass. And that would be our southern part of the prairie that's the highest level. So we worked on that area for about two years until it was starting to take care of itself a little bit. And then we chose a second area and the students in the spring, um, we mowed it then and the students um, planted forbs. Now every year after the second year, we have collected seed from the plants that are here. The students do that in the fall. We store those seeds in paper bags. The first year we tried to keep them separate, you know, keep the side oats separate from the liatris and, and we found, oh, that was way too hard. Having 150 students um, keep, that are collecting seed keep track of making sure they're putting it in the right bag. And we knew we were just gonna put it here anyway. And some plants um, prefer different areas than others, some like the dry and some like the wet, and we figured they would settle in where they wanted to be. So every year we collect seeds, and this year we had four very good sized leaf bags, paper bags of seed by the time we were done. And um, in the winter time, when we have a snow, the students come out and we mix that seed up with um, wood chipping just so we can see where we spread it. And the students spread the seeds in the snow. And then they get to roll and jump and dive and it's just <laughs> hilarious to watch them. And they have a, a, a really wonderful time being the buffalo on the prairie, we say. We're, they're the buffalo working in those seeds into that snow. So we don't collect all the seed in the prairie, we leave some of it for the wildlife, but we do collect quite a bit of seed. So we're at that point now where we have started the prairie in all the sections now. And this is after 12 years. What are the different sections that you have out here? What are the, uh, the ecosystems or what do you consider the sections? Well, first we started up in that area that was dry. And then we tried to focus on spots where people will see it when they're driving by <laughs> because we wanted it to be something that would catch their eye and make them want to stop for a minute and enjoy it. So um, we started coming down the face of the hill and then we worked on the north side where the weather box is, the entrance to the nature area. We've worked a lot on the roadside because, you know, roadsides, the soil isn't really great mm -hmm. and it has needed a lot of n nudging along to get it to, to be what it is today, but it was, it's been just lovely this year. Well, up on the hill, I would assume that that's kind of an upland prairie type of... Being much more of a dry type of the plants that like dry um, soil conditions are doing really well up there. And as we move down this hill, you can see in the distance there's a wetland there. And so there's Joe pie weed and um, more of those plants that like to have their feet a little moist seem to have settled in really well there. Well, we have a wooded area that has been an area we've kind of left alone. It's had a lot of buckthorn involved in there. But there are these beautiful, massive oak trees that no one even really knew that we had here. So an oak savanna is um, the areas in the prairie where the oak trees are, because the bur oaks could withstand the fire. And so then you'll get some of those prairie plants that like to 
be in the shade. More things like columbine and, and um, some of the plants that don't mind spending some time in, in the shade. It's an outdoor classroom, so we tried to pick plants that students will see. So early bloomers and then some late bloomers because even though the, um, the prairie is lovely right now, it's going to look very different when school starts. So we wanna make sure that there is tools here you know, for students to, to make observations on. What do you use this outdoor classroom for? My goal as a science teacher is for all science students that they have an opportunity to do authentic research, that they learn and understand and experience the work that a scientist does, and that they understand that, sure, I'm 11 years old, but I can do valid science work. So we do a lot of field studies here in the Nature area, and um, there's a couple of citizen science programs. We talk about citizen science and what it looks like and that it's work that can be done by citizens that aren't professional scientists and that there's no limit on your age. So um, we have done some things with eBird and with um, the Sunflower Project, which has to do with pollinators, with a program called Nature's um, Notebook, which is part of the National Phenology Network. And then, of course, the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project, which I've done that one for the most years, probably for 18 years. I've had students collecting data for the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project at the University of Minnesota. And that's why we have so many plants in this prairie that are plants that the monarchs like, because in the summer, the students come and monitor this, pa this piece of land for the presence of monarchs. They'll look for eggs and larvae and they'll catch some of the adults that we see flittering around us and, and identify if they're males or females and it, their behaviors, if they are nectaring or if they have mating behaviors or so that we can tell if they're just visiting or if they're living here. And then that data is used by scientists. And so when my students are collecting data and making observations and that they understand that this is going to help somebody else understand more about our ecosystem and our environment. It gives a, um, a sense of importance and authenticity to the work that they do. We also come out here to learn about diversity and to learn about living and non-living things. It's so much better to come out and see the biotic and abiotic factors of an ecosystem than it is to look at pictures in a book. So, and each student in the fall gets to select a spot that is their spot. And they, um, the, in the prairie, you can't see it now, but there's rocks all over in the prairie and in the woods and students get to come and they'll have a time where they go to their journal spot. And sometimes I'll assign something for them to observe and sometimes it's just to go and be for a few minutes. Students sometimes just need a chance to feel an ownership to, to a spot. Calms them and, and helps them to focus and helps to make them be a better student. So we do a little of that in science class and sometimes we direct what their observations are so that they can be springboards to what we're going to be doing in class. In fifth grade we focus on soil and soil types and so we make observations about the different plants that grow in, in different areas and why that would be because of the soil um, that's underneath. And, and so in the spring, the students select a specific project they're going to do, either bluebirds or um, wood ducks or aquatic invertebrates or land invertebrates or birds or amphibians and reptiles. And they will come out two or three times a week and follow a, an agreed upon protocol and will collect data on those organisms. And then they will um, report that back to each other. And with the whole goal when we're done is for them to all see that everything we do is interconnected. So the wood ducks are here because the wetland is healthy and the aquatic invertebrates are there because there's diversity on the prairie and the bluebirds are here because of the diversity of the prairie and the students over the years anecdotally um, say that since we have increased the diversity of this prairie the diversity of our organisms has gone so much in growth in comparison with that i mean that they have gone along followed the diversity of the plants on the prairie more diversity in our wetlands so helping students see that this is 
that this is valuable, changing their idea of what beauty is in one way, um, and then giving them a, a chance to have ownership. This is here because of their labor and their work and their time and their efforts. And just getting them out here and at the end of the year to have them say with confidence that they can do science work and that they are proud of the work that they've done and that they feel ownership on this piece of land. It's, it's theirs, it's, it's theirs. So you actually even have students that come in the summertime and collect data and do things too, is that correct? My summer monitors are a mixed age group of students. Sometimes they'll start with me when they're fourth graders if their teacher has recommended them and I still have a few that come and still monitor with us when they're seniors in high school. They, um, there's, there's something about it, they just, they, they love getting to be together and, and learning and then um, they get to choose a research project if they would like to and many of those students have taken those projects on to um, the regional science fair, onto the state science fair. The students that really are excited about being in the field and they're enthusiastic and they come with so much energy and so many ideas that it is what energizes me as, as a teacher that they push me to learn. And that's been this whole process of learning about a prairie. I did not know anything about prairies before I started. I learned the number one thing about a prairie is the word patience. Everything you wanna get rid of will appear those first two years and, and you just have to be patient because the prairie will win against those plants that we would not like to have in the prairie. The prairie is winning against the brome. You know, it's here, but it's um, not like it was in, in the beginning, the prairie wins. So who did the maintenance actually like? Who did the watering? And do you do a burn now to, um, to help maintain the prairie too? We um, only needed to, need to water about the first year after we plant plants. So the very first year, when we had totally burned the whole prairie and had everything down to black and we did a planting, um, we had to water more that year. And my summer students helped and my children helped. They have memories of that. So I would say after the first year, um, they have not needed any of that close care. Because we would take a section at a time, it was always doable. We never, we never did the whole thing at once so it would be focused on one area and so I could monitor that and if it needed watering then when the students would come to do their monitoring in the summer for monarchs then I'd say can you give me a few more minutes and we're, we need to do some watering and they were always excited to do that many of them had you know helped plant them either that year or year before we did a change of a trail a year or two ago and uh, moved the trail closer to the wetland so that we had a uh, defined line between the prairie that we are maintaining and an area that we aren't maintaining and so some of those plants we're still working on getting rid of those plants. I have a question. I'd like to grow some evergreens but I don't want something that will get too large. What varieties do you recommend? Most people plant the spreading junipers, yews, or some of the smaller arborvitaes, but there's many other uh, great landscape evergreens that grow very well in Minnesota. Right next to me here is a bird's nest spruce. This is a dwarf form of Norway spruce. It's just as hardy as the large Norway spruce that gets to be a huge tree is planted in windbreaks, but it stays very small. It only grows two or three inches a year and just keeps this nice rounded shape. Uh, dark green color, doesn't winter burn. It's just a really nice, uh, perfectly hardy, sm small plant that require virtually no pruning in the home landscape. We're here at the Dwarf Conifer Collection at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, and in addition to the bird's nest spruce, we have dwarf forms of white pine and red pine, even some of the spruces and firs, and there's a, these are all in a group of grafted conifers. Uh, somebody found an initial plant in a nursery or a forest and realized that it was a, just a natural dwarf and took small twigs off that original plant and grafted them onto a normal rootstock of the same species. And it's a little more expensive because they take longer to grow, and you have to graft, do the grafting, but the result is you end up with these nice small plants that are really well suited for areas near your home or in a townhouse or in a, in a small lot, something like that. You get all the hardiness and beauty of a full-size evergreen, but with a naturally compact form. 
Ask the Arboretum Experts has been brought to you by the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum in Chanhassen, dedicated to enriching lives through the appreciation and knowledge of plants. Well, I see lots of monarchs flitting around in here. And you had mentioned that you plant some of the plants specifically to try to draw them in. What are some of the plants that they just cannot resist, that you be, were sure to plant in here just to help draw them? Well, here's an example of one right here, and it's not fully in bloom yet. There's a few that are starting to um, show up, and that is Liatris, which is a, a purple flower that many times people see in flower arrangements, the monarchs. It is a favorite of theirs. Prairie um, blazing star is a common name for it. Mm -hmm. And the cone flower is a plant um, Sunflowers and, and daisies and black-eyed Susans are also plant cell nectar. But we also have milkweed here. Um, we didn't plant that milkweed, but it, uh, it appeared when, when we did our planting. One thing that we learned when, um, is that some plants need the soil disturbed. And, and milkweed is easily outcompeted by the prairie. The prairie and milkweed don't really get along. But now we have a pocket gopher out here, oh. which is a good thing <laughs> because the milkweed will show up in those disturbed areas. And so we do burn this prairie to help maintain it okay. uh, about every three years. Now, last year was the first year we did a fall burn. And we wanted to experiment with is burning in the fall versus the spring give us a different impact. And the spring burn um, gives you a, a black canvas for, so it warms up quickly and that gives a head start to prairie plants which like, their, like to be warm. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of helps knock off the brome grass which likes to grow when it's cold. Well, this last year they burned in the fall and we found that it really seems to have been a, a, a boost for the forbs, for the flowers. And I had heard that, I just had never, you know, done that before, that burning in the fall gives an advantage to the flowers versus burning in the spring gives an advantage to the grasses. You know, the prairie, I always compare it to a symphony. And so you have these movements from May when the bird's foot violet starts to bloom and the prairie smoke and, and the golden Alexander. And then you move into the next set, the early sunflowers and the coreopsis and some of those early spring flowers that the students are just lobelia, which is the students love that one. And then you get those midsummer purples and yellows that are just so delightful. And then uh, just about the second week of August or so, we, we really um, get a lot of the sunflowers, the Maximilian sunflowers. and and the asters begin to show up. And so the students really see a lot of the asters in the fall, and um, which are great plants for pollinators too, and they do a lot of observing on that. So this prairie is, is not one that you wanna just come and say, I've seen it. You need to come many, many times to see this, the whole piece, you know, the whole symphony. And from year to year, there's such variation. You know, one year the cone flowers will just be everywhere. It will be blanketed with cone flowers. And this year we had creamy um, vetch. It has never showed up in our prairie before, and today, this year it was everywhere. So I have to believe that the conditions in the spring, or maybe the burn, provide what a plant needs to, to bloom. You know, we have some plants that are just now blooming that we planted as a plant seven years ago. And that would be the compass plant and the cup plant. You know, they, those roots go so deep down into the ground that they spend all of their first years just putting the roots down. And then we'll get the leaves for a few years. And now this year we have quite a few that are blooming in the prairie. But there are many um, organisms that also, and even pollinators that utilize the grasses. There are some um, butterflies that the grasses are their host plants so we want to make sure that that we have a variety of plants in in this ecosystem so that we'll have a variety of organisms of uh, insects and animals. Laura tell me what has been the reaction of the community and the regular homeowners to your prairie area? Well those that discover this site it's a little hidden behind the school are always amazed and are 
returners. <laughs> they return often. I just ran into a lady last night who said she comes here on her walk every day because it's, it's just such a serene place to be. The response from the school has just been positive. There are days, Mary, when it's just so exciting. I'll have students spread all over the prairie doing their journaling, and there'll be high school students on the dock collecting um, samples of water and invertebrates, and there'll be the art students up by the outdoor classroom area drawing, and there'll be another group that's bird watching from, the, from another class, and it's just, the, it's just wonderful. And we all can work together, and, and the students respond to this so respectfully because this is, they've done the work and this is their place. So they want to protect it and, and just um, to have it just be less than three minute walk from the school has um, provided for the students this place of escape. Laura, I heard that due to your innovative and wonderful teaching techniques that you have received some awards. Can you tell us about that? Well, first, I, I, um, I should address that um, the way that I teach is, is different than the way I was taught how to teach. And I, I have to say that I give credit to my administration and in this community that they have been supportive of me teaching in a way that's different, that they trust that I'm doing for the students what needs to be done and the students show quite are successful. And yes, because of some of those unusual ways that we do things of getting out here and getting messy, I have been recognized by my peers and by um, the people that I work with. This winter was the Soil Water Conservation District. I was received the Conservation Teacher Award of the Year and have received the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science Teaching and the Minnesota Science Teachers Award. And those um, mean so much because uh, recognition by other people that are working in the field and that they recognize that what the students are doing here is so valuable. And I give the students credit and their parents and the school for, um, al you know, for allowing us to do things in the way that we do. I'm very, very fortunate to be part of, of this process and this project. Well, Laura, thank you so much for letting us come to your outdoor classroom. We really, really appreciate it. I've been looking forward to you getting to see it, Mary. So thank you for coming and enjoying our, our symphony that we have here. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided in part by Heartland Motor Company, providing service for over 30 years in the heart of truck country. Heartland Motor Company, we have your best interest at heart. Farmers Mutual Telephone Company and Federated Telephone Cooperative, proud to be powering a CIRA. Mark and Margaret Yako Jolene, in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. Shalomhill.org.